There we go. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming today. I'm looking for the songbook because I'm shocked, shouldn't be, but uh, how God does things and how great it fits. What was the first song we sang today? I'll tell the wondrous story. Aha! I thought he was going to steal my my sermon. <laughs> we need those verses, don't we? We need to read those songs. Sometimes they have all these on projections over behind you, and it's three words. Well, they call it seven eleven songs. Seven words repeated eleven times. <laughs> uh, that was a sermon in that song. What was the second one we sang? He lives, okay? He lives. Isn't that what we're really all about? That's what our, our statements and our faith and our, our whole... Why do we come together? It's because of Jesus Christ. If we never hear that, what are we doing here? I was talking with our son this week, and that's what he was pointing out, that people are not hearing about Christ. They don't even know what he did or, or what it means. What Christianity means, what, what's the whole story about? They don't even know. What's the third song we sang? It is, pardon? Whosoever meaneth me? Yeah, okay. Same idea, sermon in a song. And the last song, I think we only sang one, one other maybe. Three? Okay. But isn't that amazing? Can you guess what the sermon is about? Unrelated, totally unrelated. That's a God thing. How to be an effective Christian. How to be an effective Christian. Isn't that amazing that God puts these things together with nobody knowing that it's going to happen? Or you think random choosing of song? Uh, <laughs> God was there. <laughs> okay. So let's begin. There's a, a verse from 1 John 2, verse 6, that says, He that saith he abideth in him, in Jesus Christ, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. We need that guidance. We need that, that direction from him. And then I, I right away when I was thinking about that verse, I thought, you know, uh, Brother Don, in, in, in um, Oregon now, he would say it's as easy as one, two, three. And you say, no, wait a minute, what's, what's he really mean, one, two, three? And he's happy to tell you and explain. He tells anybody and everybody that's willing to listen. First John, chapter two, verse three and four. <laughs> one, two, three, four. So let's read that passage. First John. Chapter 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That easy? Well, we need verse 4 as well. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandment is a liar, and the truth is not in him. One of the first times I heard this explained was, let's see, 1963, somewhere about there, when a brother came from Oklahoma City with his wife, and, and they had a little baby soon, or were with them, and he said he was of a different faith in the background. His family line was a different faith, but this one got him, and he would say, I need to be keeping God's ways, God's rules, God's commandments, statutes, and standards. And he said, uh, or else, uh, if you're not doing it, you don't know him, he is a liar, and the truth ain't in him. <laughs> that was his Oklahoma accent. <laughs> and the truth ain't in him. <laughs> and boy, that sunk in. And I thought, wow, isn't that neat? The truth. There's always something that we need to know. That, that we, we catch verses here and there. My mother sent me that book on... Um, when they came out of Egypt and God said to them, if you'll do my statutes and my standards and my ways, 
none of these diseases will come on you. Hey, I, I, I want that one, you know. <laughs> so she, my mother sent me a little book. And that's probably upwards of 20 years ago when she sent that to me. God was preparing me. God was giving me something that was very, very special. And then as you're reading through the Bible, we use the CDs, you know. And then we just follow along and then we get time to underline things. And oops, stop, I want to catch that one, you know. Um, that's easy to do. And uh, when I'm running across these verses over and over in every book as we're going along, that God says, you need to do my ways, or I'm not even going to listen to your prayers. I'm not going to see you praying. I'm not going to, you know, you know, no, wait a minute. Now, I'd rather have it the other way around where he's attentive to me, that he's listening, that he's concerned. And when I call out, he said, well, you can cry. I said, I'm not going to hear you cry. Wow. What if you were in Egypt and you're crying and God wasn't listening? He was listening because he got a hold of Moses and said, hey, you go back there. You get him out of there. <laughs> okay. So that was a special verse that, uh, that Don gave me as well. That's one, two, three. And uh, uh, two says, well, verse one in that chapter says that it's Jesus Christ that has sent the advocate. It's Jesus Christ. And that it was his atoning sacrifice in verse two, the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice. And that takes us all the way down through um, verse five even. But whoso keepeth the word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. That, that book has got to be, this John, First John, has got to be the tests. And it gives me the answers as well. The test is, do you know him? Do you know Christ? And the answers are there. As easy as that. Hereby we know that we are in him, if you're doing those things. So in this effective, uh, how to be an effective Christian, we need to be thinking about being unselfish. I didn't figure that one out till Tim, uh, I did it wrong again, Titus. <laughs> I, I've got a problem with words that start with the same letter and I'm after them, my mind doesn't get... <laughs> okay. Uh, um, to come with a story of how we can be unselfish in helping others. The next part of this will be understanding. If we understand the situation, in the Old Testament there was people that understand the times that they were in. Yeah, we need to have that understanding. Being useful. <laughs> Have we heard that already uh, this morning? <laughs> okay. Uh, being undaunted. Somebody say, why did you do that? You, know, you ought not to. Uh, we're supposed to be undaunted and be uplifting and uplifted ourselves and uplift others. So let's take a run at this. So verse in James chapter 1 verse 2 that reads, part of the verse reads this way, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. That's how we become unselfish as well. We do it for Christ. Jesus was not selfish or self-centered. He came to do the Father's will and to do it for other people that were here to save us. Um, he lived for others so that they might have hope and that they might have eternal life. And there's, he felt their sorrows, and he brought healing to them, and he heard people say what they were hurting about and what it was all about, and, and he attended to their, their needs. We too must be unselfish. We must give ourselves in total commitment to God, letting him use us to help others and to be a blessing to others. Jesus gave himself, as his father was asking him to do, allowing himself to be the sacrifice for the world, to save us from sin and from a lost situation where we'd go to the hot spice, as some say. Um, Jesus did that for us. I want to turn to James. 
James chapter 2. I wanted 15 and 16, and I decided when I was studying hard enough, I thought I need 17 and maybe run to 20. So follow me to James chapter 2, and I'm going to start with verse 17. Kind of get the beginning of the story, you might say, or, or enough words that it touches what we need. Even so, faith, if it hath not, pardon me, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Faith and works. What do we get out of the normal situation of Christianity nowadays? There's no works. You don't have to do anything. You're not involved. It's just there free and you just accept it and go your way. You don't have to be fixed anyway. You don't have to correct anything. You don't have to be, change your mannerism. Just add this one pill to your diet and all your pounds will walk away from you. <laughs> uh, I guess I've had a few many, too many commercials as well. But faith without works is dead because it's alone. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. How can they leave out the word works? It's important. It's all over the New Testament that we need to do something. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. They actually believe. So believing is not enough. There's something more that's needed. Verse 20. But thou wilt know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Interesting thought there, that we've got to match up faith and works, otherwise it's a dead situation. And you could read more uh, after that, but I better carry on here. To be understanding, there's a verse in... Uh, I'm going to get to there too. So let's go to Zechariah. Now I hope I got the right J there. Bet I didn't. I'll have a paper there. Just a second, I'll get there. Zechariah, that's the one I want. Zechariah chapter 7. And I'm not sure I'm right because i got a paper in there. <laughs> okay, Zechariah chapter 7. I'll start at verse 9 and I'll read a couple of verses. Verse 9. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgments and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. Oh, that would fit in to serving God and doing what Jesus did. Verse 10. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger. When the Bible talks about a stranger, it's actually a, an alien from another country that's living in your country, legally or illegally. Of course, they had ways of telling there, in their country. And if you had properly joined the nation and joined the religion, you'd, you'd know so. <laughs> Circumcision was involved, okay? So you'd know that you were involved or whether you were still a stranger. And then not to oppress nor the poor and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Wow. Um, do you see any evil in the advertisements that are coming to your mailbox, let alone TV and radio? It can be lightly talked of as mud throwing. Oh, man. Boy, don't imagine evil against your brother. You think that you're going the same place trying to get the country to work well and the state to work well and so on. And, uh, all that mud throwing. Verse 11, but they refused to hearken and pulled away their shoulder. I can just see them and, uh, I'm not going to do that. 
turn away and pull their shoulder. Stop their ears. You know, hold their fingers to their ears. There's even one that put the branch to the ears they used to do with their fingers. Yeah. See the poor and let... Uh, no, I'm down in verse 11 here. Stop their ears that they should not hear. They did not want to hear and they were going to make sure they couldn't hear. Some even try to sing some silly little tune to uh, make it that they can't hear. Stop their ears and do that. Yea, they make their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent to his, uh, in his spirit by the former prophets. They didn't want to hear what was written, didn't want to hear the prophets, didn't want to hear God's talking to them. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Wow. It's not good when you get God upset, right? There was a Oklahoma State Conference one time when I preached on, do you really want to make God angry? I'll tell you how. And I went through quite a few verses of what God is angry about and what he hates. And we ought to stay away from all of those kind of things. Verse 13. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried, they uh, would not bear so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. You're not doing God's will. Why are you crying to God then? Go to your other gods. Go elsewhere. Let him help you. Instead, they, they don't want to hear, and yet they want to try to expect God to hear their prayers. And he says, the Lord, the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the YHVH, the Lord of hosts, that's what he's talking about here. Why should I hear him? I will not hear. But I scattered them. Um, glasses here again. But I scattered them with the whirlwind among all the nations whom they know not. Thus the land was desolate after them that no man passed through neither returned, for they, uh, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. They're destroying what God had given them. And he took them away from there and scattered them, and the country was left desolate, and nobody was even walking through it. It was so bad, and it was the most pleasant land there ever was before this. You water it, and it'll grow. There was going to be Milk and honey, that means milk you have to have grass. And honey, you need the bees. Bees don't live there if there isn't fruit and things to pollinate and so on. That was a very, very good land. And they ignored it, so God scattered them like a whirlwind. Got them out of there. Okay, so we need to have that understanding uh, of what God really wants. We need to know what Christ felt when he was here for all people. And he uh, understood the suffering of people, the sorrow of people, the sinfulness of people. And he spoke to all of those things. Sometimes I say in sermons, you ought to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but only the red letters. Find out what Jesus had to say. Okay. Alrighty. Just a little comedy side there, you might say. We also must be understanding and if, to be an effective Christian, have Christian feelings, uh, sympathy uh, for the infirm people, the problems, their concerns, um, and who's undergoing trials and tests in their lives. We, we need to be concerned for them and be able to say something pleasant or something helpful to them. To be useful, in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Isn't that interesting? We're working side by side with the Heavenly Father. He needs a job done, and, and we are the hands and fingers and the feet and the ears and the, and the lips that this can be done. We're helping God. Laborers together. Uh, let me go there to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, because there's a few more verses there I want to look at. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm in, uh, I want to look back at chapter seven, verse 7 and 8, and then 9 through 11 and 12 and 14. But maybe i just talk through it a bit here if I can. In, uh, oh yes, okay, chapter 3. You know what's going on in verse uh, 5, 6? Apollos. Some were for Apollos. Some were for Paul. And it was making trouble. So verse 7. Uh, so then neither is he that planteth anything. Ah, we fit in. We can work with God. We can be a planter. Neither he that watereth. Maybe I'm not the planter. Maybe I'm the one that carries the water. Okay, very good. But God that giveth the increase. So don't worry about the increase. God's going to do that. He's, he's got that figured out. We're expected to do the watering or the planting. And, you know, he, he's given us things to do. Verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. You're actually working for the same cause. You're on the same side. You're in the same team. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Some churches, again, they wouldn't want you to be working for a reward. They wouldn't want you working labor and expecting to be paid for it. Or It's right here in the scripture. God remembers. He's keeping a list. But we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandmen. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Oh, we need somebody that fits the bill, the master builder, and we're just helping. I laid the foundation and another built the built their pond. Oh, don't, don't worry about it. It's all, it's all for the same cause. But it let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. That's the wisdom that we need. We need to be useful and understanding and so on. Uh, one lays a foundation in the next person. Another man would build on it. But who laid the foundation originally? Jesus Christ there in verse 11. In verse 12, if any man build upon this foundation with this and this and this and this, uh, there's uh, more coming. Every man's work shall be manifested for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is and then it says and if you lose at this point or if it if the work is good and stays there if a man work abide which he hath built thereupon he shall receive a reward why not? Why don't we want the reward? Why shouldn't we work for the reward? The rest of the story is good there. If we work with the master builder, if we work with the heavenly father, we work with Jesus Christ, we work with the scriptural teachings of the apostles and, and Paul and so on, uh, there's a reward. There's a reward that's going to come. So we can do that. We can be useful and, and look forward to a reward. So... Uh, we must witness where we can and touch people's lives and get them to accept Christ as their Savior. Find out who Jesus is. Find out that he is a Savior. What does that mean? You're going to have to explain that. Remember when uh, Philip met the eunuch? And he said, uh, uh, I see you're reading. And he said, well, I'm reading here in Isaiah and I don't understand the story. Well, now let me help. <laughs> Uh, can you just see Philip very politely, kindly, uh, courteously saying, I'm, good that you, I'm glad that you found that verse. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about his work and what it's all about. And uh, it doesn't say what all he said, but all of a sudden the eunuch says, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? And the question then was back to him, well, do you really believe? You know, that's a problem. You can baptize a person, they go down a, a wet sinner and come up a wet sinner. Well, down, go down a dry sinner and come up a wet sinner. You've accomplished nothing. That's not going to help. It has to be a change of heart. The heart has to change. And this man said, yes, I believe. I believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah that was to come. I believe. 
He said, then, okay, let's do it. Let's get you baptized. Okay. Um, so that's a way of saving people for everlasting life, is what I'm, I think about that. In uh, Romans chapter 12, and as soon as I read Romans and the word 12, I knew what was in the first chapter. Don't you always know some of those things? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Ah, so, yes, that would be a good verse. But, we, but I actually want to go down to verse 11. Not slothful in business. Oh, we have to be useful. We have to understand what we're doing and how we're doing it, why we're doing it. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. Well, we've got to figure out what that is. What's the trade? What's the work? What's the job to, uh, description? Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. We, we need to do these things, right? This, to me, sounded like Proverbs. Do this, and do this, and do this, and do this. Okay. And it's all, it's all good things and all easy things and it's all a blessing. It's not like, oh, do I have to have hope? <laughs> it's a blessing to have hope, okay? Distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Wow, very nice. Bless them that persecute you. Oh, now you're getting into Jesus' sermon in Matthew 5. Right? Getting a second dose of it, right? Bless them that persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. That's being used of the Lord to be there for people. Be of the same mind one toward another. How would you like that? You know, uh, what if they treated you that way? You know, have this mind in there that's going on that's good. Mind not the high things, but condescend to men of low estate. You don't have to take yourself down to their estate. That's not the idea. But you need to understand their state that they're in and raise them from their, their problem state that they're in. Be not wise in your own conceit. Oh, I, I'm, I, I got higher than you did. Too bad you're down there. You know, I'm not going to help you because, no, that's not Jesus' attitude. That's Jesus' way. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honestly in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, be peaceful with all men and ladies and women to women and so on. Okay. To all persons, all humans. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You know, we can step in God's way. I mean, get, in, get in his path, get in his way. God will take care of this wrath thing and he's going to recompense. And why should we stick our foot in there? Let God do his part. Well, what about this wrath thing? It's evidently okay because we found, even in the Sabbath school lesson, we talked about be angry and sin not. It allows you to be angry. When Jesus made the whip, and he started chasing people out of the temple, I think they understood he would have hit them pretty hard if they didn't get out of the way. When he dumped over the tables, they got out of the way. They knew he was angry. Now, how long did he keep his anger? Just a few minutes. That's not his way. He needed to step outside the door and run into somebody that was hurting or in pain and, and uh, discomfort. And uh, he needed to talk with them and help them with salvation. He was not angry on the cross because of what they were doing to him. Wherefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Wow. If he thirst, give him drink. If in thy doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. It's not because we want to give him the coals. It's because that's the right thing to do is to help him out. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's so much like Proverbs to me. Okay, be undaunted. There's a verse in Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, that reads partly like this. He it is that doeth go before thee. Doeth go before you. 
Who is it that's going before you? It's the Heavenly Father. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Over and over and over, when you read of those contests that they had and conflicts and fighting and wars and whatever you want to call it, many of the time the enemy ran away and were fighting themselves while they're trying to get away. Couldn't get the scripture says that, that one of you can chase away a thousand. A hundred would be good enough, but <laughs> wow. If you're serving God. Some of their battles, God said, I'll send the bees in ahead of you, the hornets, I'll send the hornets ahead of you to chase the people out so that the good people didn't have to do that much extra work. But you need to be courageous enough to go. Jesus was courageous, and he came to earth, knowing the whole story. He said, I have to go up to Jerusalem. Remember, Paul said that too, I have to go up to Jerusalem. What do you mean, crying and saying that you're upset with me? Yeah, he had to go. He faced the accusers fearlessly. Not even the death could hold him. They couldn't win over him because he kept his composure. He was undaunted in his service to the Heavenly Father and he knew what was going to happen. In uh, Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, I thought maybe I'd quote part of this too, but I better, better look. Deuteronomy 31, Verse 6. Be strong and have good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doeth go with thee, doth go with thee, he will not fail thee nor forsake thee. If we have that trust, who can be of good, good courage. Because God's going to go with us through all of the troubles and tribulations and problems that are there. It should be, oh yes, verse 8 and verse 6, so I, I didn't want to miss either one of them. But verse 8 is one I read part of just a moment ago. So you might want to glance over that one again. Uh, and the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. So it's a repeat of verse 6. He will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. That's just like verse 6 restated, right? Two verses. Okay, one last go here a little bit on being uplifting to others and be uplifted ourselves. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus was willing to do that. He was going to be lifted up in pain and agony and torture, uh, the nails being driven. Um, yeah, I'm sure they didn't care how much pain they gave to the person that they were driving the nails through or putting them up there. They weren't careful how they put the post down the hole. Probably just dropped it in. Um, he's going to die anyway. If he hurts more, he just dies sooner. Yeah, that kind of attitude. But Jesus was lifted up so that we would have that salvation through Jesus Christ, through him dying on the cross. He was lifted up. He was victorious over death and the grave. We can be uplifted too when we understand that he did it for us and that that makes us a brother with him. It makes us also right with God if we accept that as salvation. We can be effective for Christ and we can be free from the bondage of sin sin is bondage holds us down even stop our prayers if we let it get away with it if the son of man therefore make thee free he shall be free indeed it's John 8 36 and then I started thinking about that uh, the bondage that we can be held in and there's, uh, there's even a book made the slave and slave of Christ. Uh, we use uh, servant and we use words like that, but it actually meant slave. And you did not have your own free will. You were controlled by somebody else. If this bondage is on us, sin's bondage on us, we do not have our own will. We are controlled by somebody else. We don't want that. We need to accept Jesus Christ and get out from under that. 
in my Bible in John 8. John 8, 34. Turn with me to John 8, verse 34. Oh, I did put a paper in there. So when I put a paper in, I'm sure I want to read it. So John 8, and verse 34, and 35, and 36. 36 is on this page, so I've got to go back one page. And it says there, uh, in verse 35, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Ah, yeah, a slave doesn't live in the house all the time. And verse 36, The son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but I speak, but I seek to, but ye seek to kill me. Jesus is saying this. Because my word hath no place in you. We need to get that right. Get the, the place in us. So verse 34 I left out. But I should read what Jesus had to say there. Verily, verily I say unto you. Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. So I wrote slave in between the lines. And underneath that at the bottom I wrote. One slave cannot set free another slave but the master's son can. If we know Jesus Christ as the Heavenly Father's Son, he can set us free. May God bless you.